Uh, good afternoon to you. I know Lou Cellini. I did my uh, postdoc there at uh, Noah Ness. When you were struggling every millibar with uh, Bob Atlas and Steve Tracton on the President Day storm, so I'm the, from the same generation. But uh, what I would talk today would be out the, about two events, actually. One of them was the issuance of the meteorological forecast for the attack of the atomic uh, reactor in Baghdad, to compare with one millibar. Mm -hmm. And the second one would be how really, if, if a pilot knows the climate, he can save a soul. It's a story about an accident. So one day in February, it was in the middle of February, uh, Colonel Aviem Sela comes to me and asks me, Noah, he says, uh, what is the climate over Baghdad? So I'm looking at Sela. I know Sela is asking very serious questions. So I say to him, you know, Sela, if you want to bomb the atomic reactor, why don't you ask it directly? I'll give you an answer. So he looks at me and says, uh, who told you about this operation? He said, you just confessed. So he takes me to the room and makes me sign uh, as accomplished as a partner to this uh, very big secret, and says, yes, we are planning uh, to do it. Maybe we will have somebody there who would give us the weather at the day, but maybe we would not have somebody there. And uh, because I've signed you on this secret, I ask you to issue every day a forecast for Baghdad, for the reactor, and try to verify yourself, and every month report to me how accurate you are. And this is, was a very difficult time to issue a forecast. This is, was 81. There was the war between uh, Iraq and Iran, and neither of these countries transmitted any surface observations. So there wasn't. So there was a one lousy satellite, either NOAA 4, NOAA 5, which you had to take a magnifying glass and see whether you have a cloud or not. So every day, I issue the forecast. I try to verify the winds back on the fuel consumption. And Sela would have checked. And we looked and checked. And you look. And what Iftar said is very accurate. When you are going to bomb the atomic reactor, you have one shot. If you go back, you can't come the next day because they know that you have tried. So either you do it successfully or you don't do it at all. So comes the big day, I think it was the eve of Pentecost, Erev Shavuot, eve of Pentecost. Sela catches me by the ear and says, Noah, he says, today's the day. That's it. You have to issue the forecast. And you really look what type of initialization, observations you have. You are alone. The forecaster is really alone. He's the only one who signed on the forecast. He has nobody to consult. The models, everybody know how good they are. There are no observations. There's a satellite picture, the NOAA 4, you take. And you issue the forecast, and you are really afraid. Because if you missed, everybody in the headquarters would shoot you, like the five days. Everybody would shoot you. You wouldn't be there. So it's a very responsible job, because you are sending eight aircrafts on your world. And Iftar didn't uh, mention, but uh, the attack was kind of CCIP, which means you have to pull up. When you pull up, you see the reactor, and then you pull down, and you aim at the reactor. And if there are clouds in between, too many clouds, you, you can't lock on the target. So there's a limit on the number of clouds. And you have to actually forecast that it wouldn't be more than two or three thirds two or three eighths of the cloud to be covered. And this is what you are requested. So what do they give you? They give you a mission. They give you a lousy satellite station, no data, a model with some upper air winds, and don't forecast the clouds wrongly. So today I was lucky, I tell you. It was a clear day. But the tension uh, to sit there and think and realize what responsibility is just on you, is very big. So I was kind of, uh, I would say, the summit of my career as a forecaster. I don't dare to issue any more forecasts because I might miss. So I remain with the glory of this forecast. 
So uh, a forecaster is really an essential part of every mission because at the same time which Iftach did this attack on Damascus, there was another squadron which was to the south or to the west, I cannot recall, which did reach Damascus and on another track, on another route. There are. And at the same time, uh, there was the, the American uh, under Jimmy Carter tried to go for the hostages in Tehran and rescue them. And I've seen at that same time, I've seen the report of the Senate committee as to the weather forecast for this mission. Everybody knows that the forecast there was clear. But if you tell a pilot, listen, you go, after 100 kilometers, there would be a sandstorm. You have to rise about 300 feet above the ground, you'll be above the sand, you fly for 50 more kilometers, then it would be clear. The pilot would believe you and may go. But what happened there, they took the duty forecaster, and it's written in the Senate uh, debrief. They took the duty forecaster in Homa, Nebraska, at the Strategic Air Command. They asked him three questions. They pointed at Buenos Aires and asked him, what is the weather? And he gave them. Then they asked him at Rammstein in Germany, what is the weather? And then they asked him about a point in Iran. As good as the question was good, the answer. Because the forecaster didn't know what are the sensitivities of the mission. What is the visibility? Are you looking for sandstorms? What is the climate of this area? What do you have to search? And if you look, and even at that time, I remember some works which I did at uh, NOAA then. If you look at the picture, you enhance it, you increase it, you can see sandstorms in the night. But they asked him such a simple question, so they got a silly answer. So they flew directly into the sandstorms. And I still remember it very vividly because I would say that in the Israeli Air Force, such a thing would not happen because the forecaster is an integral part of the operational system. He knows the mission, he knows the sensitivities, and therefore he learns what to forecast, what to need. And I would end up with something which everybody who goes to Adas uh, lectures do learn. And this is an accident which happened uh, in the Israeli Air Force. Obviously, I'm away from the service for many years, so it would be, again, phantoms. And there was night. It was night, and it was summer. And there was a squadron of about 12 to 14 phantoms making some exercise uh, opposite to the Syrian coast. It was training. They were flying at 12,000 feet into the coast, back to the coast, into the coast, back to the coast. About midnight, the Met Office issued a warning about low stratus clouds and fog forming in the southern coastal plain of Israel. So they decided to return. Now everybody here who sits here knows the climatology of the Israeli Air Force bases. And uh, one of the pilots saw it and started to see the clouds, and he said, okay, instead of Air Force Base number four, Chatzor, I'll land in Tel Nof. Everybody knows Tel Nof is better than... The one plane made a mistake, I think a, a couple. Everybody who learns meteorology in Israel knows that in the summer, the best Air Force Base to land, the cleanest, the one with the least of problems, is wing number one, Ramat David, in the Valley of Israel. Everybody knows that if you go to Hatserim, you're bound to find more stratus and more clouds than if you go uh, to Hatzor. But this pilot made a mistake. He went to Hatserim, which is about 60, 70 kilometers to the south. Upon reaching Hatserim base, then his end of the fuel, he makes one round and he doesn't see the runway. And now you have to ask yourself, am I trying to do another round? Or am I going back to where I cannot reach Air Force Base number one anymore? So he makes another round, and he still doesn't see the lights. And he makes the third round. In the third round, he saw lights. So he was very happy that he saw the lights, and he landed. Unfortunately, that was the Kedem. That was the short runway for the exercise and the training of the light aircraft. So instead of 2,400 meters, it is about a kilometer, something like this. So he lands the Phantom, 
And at the end of the runway, he sees that that's the end of the runway. So the Phantom rams into the sand at the end. Pilot killed. The navigator was fortunately ejected at the last minute. This is not humoristic, but if you really learn the climatology of the certain Air Force bases and you know it, you would have done like the first pilot. Instead of going south, you would have checked or looked for the base. So I think that knowing meteorology is something which is very basic for the safety of military as well as uh, civil aviation. And again, we are talking about the application. And sometimes mistaken in understanding the weather are not just I forgot my umbrella, is I didn't perform the mission of attacking the Syrian Pentagon, I missed the forecast for the atomic reactor, or somebody just killed because he wasn't keen enough on climatology. Thank you.